Hey, what's up, YouTube? In this episode of the Electric Geo Tracker series, I'll be introducing you to the base vehicle itself and the plans I have for it. Before we begin, I'd like to thank this video's sponsor, MetalSupermarkets.com. They are a metal supplier with locations all across the United States. The really cool thing about them is that despite stocking over 8,000 different grades, types, and shapes of metal, they'll handle even the smallest order all the way up to large industrial orders. Not only that, they can provide same-day delivery along with knowledgeable advice from associates that are there to listen to your needs and provide solutions. If you're interested, you can click the link in the description below. Now back to the introduction of the tracker. This is the base donor vehicle that I chose to convert to electric. The reason I chose a Geo Tracker is because it is a dependable four-wheel drive compact SUV that is also very light and that will be very important later. In addition to that, it was extremely inexpensive. As you can see here, I've already begun to tear down some components which I'll explain later. Let me catch you up on where it came from and what I've done uh, thus far. So uh, if you can see here, I've done some preliminary repairs, I've already you know, torn down the engine, uh, but I do also want to note where it came from. So in January of 2019, I picked this car up from this gentleman right here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I towed it like 250 miles back. This car cost me uh, $400, so it's a really good deal. I managed to sell the engine and transmission for $450, so there was a net gain there. Here you can see uh, I tore down the top end because uh, I fixed the uh, timing error. It was uh, too uh, retarded, which means it's opposite of advanced. Um, here I also uh, fixed some electrical errors. The turn signal kept on uh, making a ticking sound because it was having a uh, short to power. So I fixed that and I was able to drive it around for a little bit. Unfortunately, I don't have any footage. I do want to show you guys here like how I tore down the engine. So I'm just going to time lapse some stuff. Uh, it began pretty easy. Uh, I just tore down the top end. Uh, as you can see from the beginning of the video, that was when I was pulling in the vehicle in order to tear it down. Uh, it was pretty self-explanatory how I tore it down. Just very systematic. Uh, you know, very tight shop and it was very cold, but generally it's pretty all right. So just sit back and enjoy. So one of the secrets of uh, keeping the electric car project uh, cost down as it's almost completely independently funded is just to recuperate as many parts as you can and sell them. So I was able to sell uh, the engine, transmission and various other parts for about $450. So there definitely was a net gain there. Uh, it, and also it freed up a lot of space. A lot of these like internal combustion engine components are definitely very, very heavy. And also you can see here, the frame is relatively rust free, which is great for a Northeast car. And you know, definitely, like I said, a very good buy. With the basic intro done, we now come to the general overview of the circuitry. Here you can see a good rendition of a basic EV conversion circuit, courtesy of electriccarpartscompany.com. Though it's a bit blurry, I'll do my best to explain it. Let's start at the traction battery since that's what we covered in the last video. From the positive of the battery, we go to the battery pack fuse in series, which is 400 amps in our case. After that is the contactor. If you don't know what a contactor is, imagine it as a really heavy duty relay. When you close a, a switch on ignition, it will go from an open state to a closed state, which will allow current to flow from the battery positive to the motor controller. However, there's a small detail that needs to be covered. 
Do you see this resistor right here? This is something called a pre-charge resistor. The theory behind using a pre-charge resistor wired in parallel is that without using one, closing the contacts of the contactor would create a large inrush current and several electrical arcs. This could potentially weld shut the contacts and not allow you to disable the contactor. Also, using a pre-charge resistor allows the many capacitors in the motor controller to charge slowly, prolonging its life. There is one small detail from here, and it's that the pre-charge resistor should have a time delay circuit represented here by this box, so that after a calculated period of time, say five seconds, the time delay circuit disconnects the pre-charge resistor, thus allowing all the current to flow through just the contactor. This will improve efficiency and range. This small relay here is called the KSI relay, which is simply a relay connected to a key switch that would enable or disable the controller. I may or may not put it in. Now we come to the motor controller. As you can see, there are four major contacts. My controller, which I'll cover in another video, is different in that basically the main po battery positive and negative go into two separate contacts on the controller, just like this one. But unlike this one, there are only two other separate contacts for motor positive and negative. The other three contacts here are for the potentiometer, which will be the throttle. Before I get to that, let's step back a bit. On this side of the diagram, we have our 12 volt auxiliary battery. It will be connected to the positive of our main battery via the converters we saw in my last video. The negative will also go to the vehicle body ground. The positive will also go to the auxiliary battery fuse, then to the key switch. My setup will be a bit different from this. The key switch will activate a relay that will go to the contactor. After the motor controller is powered up, it will send 5 volts to the potentiometer throttle box, otherwise known uh, as the pot box for short. The pot box will have a 45 degree swing potentiometer that the controller will use to create an output PWM signal for the motor. How it does that is that when you depress the throttle to say 50%, the 5 volts going into the pot box will come out as a 2.5 volt signal back to the controller. This will tell the controller that you are at 50% throttle. Of course, the ground will also be supplied from the controller. I think it's also very important to note that the controller will be using the same ground as the auxiliary battery, not the main traction battery. After all this circuitry, we come to the motor. I have a series wound motor at four contacts. Here you can see how I'm going to wire my motor. These contacts are stator one, stator two, armature one, and armature two. In this configuration with A2 connected to S2 and A1 connected to battery positive and S1 connected to battery negative, the motor will rotate clockwise. Should I want it to rotate counterclockwise, I would instead connect A2 and S1, then A1 to positive and S2 to negative. All right, let's visualize this in a simpler way. Here is a side photo of a tracker very similar to mine, same generation. The motor and transmission will of course go in the front where the engine was. It will sit longitudinally. The battery and motor controller with the most of the aforementioned circuitry will be in the back where the rear seats were. The main high voltage cables will most likely run underneath the vehicle or under the carpet. Speaking of the motor, let me introduce the motor transmission. The motor I'm using is a traction motor out of an old Clark ECS30 forklift that I got from this repair shop for $100. In this next shot over here, you can see me testing it with a 12 volt battery to check if it works. It works, but it will definitely need a rebuild, which I'll cover in a later video. It weighs in at roughly 185 pounds and puts out 16 kilowatts or roughly 22 horsepower. This isn't much, but it is nearly 90% efficient and you get all the torque even at low RPMs, unlike internal combustion engines. I got the transmission from a guy out in Pennsylvania for about $50, a case of beer and a pizza. When I got there, he told me it was on top of a nearby mountain. The only way we could get it out was by using my Jeep to flip it over. Then we quickly got out of there, since it was 9 p.m. in the middle of the woods. It is a 5-speed manual, which will replace the 3-speed automatic originally in my tracker for several reasons. First, the automatic has a vacuum modulator that is load-based. This means that depending on the load on the engine, it will have a specific vacuum that will then be a part of the input into the transmission that will make it shift to a certain gear. This would be unnecessarily complex to implement in my tracker. Second, a manual allows for great controllability in terms of whether or not I want more torque or more speed. 
Something that's interesting is that with an electric motor, I will not need a clutch to use the transmission. Since there's little inertial mass with an electric motor, to shift, you simply let up on the throttle and slowly shift to the required gear. All in all, it was a better choice. I'll be covering the mating of the motor transmission in my next video, so stay tuned. Alright, that concludes the intro to a tracker and the plans I have for it. If you guys liked what you saw, please leave a like and subscribe. See you guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.